in honor of Charles Barbier's birthday. We have a special guest. Today, Philippa Campsey is joining us. She is a retired university professor, and she has published a paper called Charles Barbier, A Hidden Story. And when I first talked to Philippa, I was impressed that she flew all the way from Canada to France to read letters and other documents written by Charles, Louis Braille, and other key players for the invention of Braille. So who better to teach us about Charles and Philippa? Well, thank you very much, Philippa, for joining us. Thank you. Good to talk about, about, always happy to talk about Barbier. And if you can read what my chest says, it says Charles Barbier fan club. <laughs> I'm so far the only member. <laughs> well, I'm it. the second. <laughs> okay. Nice. Are those written with gems? Yes, this is an eye t-shirt. Um, and so they're, they're little pearl-like things that, uh, that spell out the words. That's awesome. So today, uh, we're going to talk about five things you need to know about Charles. So starting off with our first point is his military career was short and it ended by the time he was 25. So much of what has been written about the invention of Braille and the role played by Charles Barbier stresses his military career to the point where it is suggested that he invented raised point writing for the military. Uh, but he's he's always referred to as Captain Charles Barbier, or sometimes just the captain. In uh, children's books and little videos, he's almost invariably portrayed wearing some sort of military uniform. But in fact, his military career was very short. Um, he started at a military academy at the age of 17 um, and served briefly, but the French Revolution broke out and in uh, 1789. And after a few years, he realized, along with most of his colleagues um, in the officer class, that France was not a good place to be um, an army officer. Uh, army officers were drawn from the ranks of the aristocracy, and Charles Barbier came from a minor branch of the aristocracy. And so like about 50% of the army officers in France at that time, he left the country. Brings us to our second point. Charles lived in the United States for 10 years or possibly longer, which I didn't know this until I was talking with you in January, the last time we had an interview. Yeah, interestingly, um, in, in April, I went down to give a talk about Barbier um, at the American Printing House for the Blind which is in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Well, it's, they told me that when I was there, it's actually pronounced more like Louisville, but that was hard for me to do, um, which is very close to Lexington. In fact, the, um, the director of the museum lives in Lexington and commutes to Louisville. And uh, Lexington is where Barbier lived for perhaps as long as 10 years. We know when he went to the United States, um, we know he left in, uh, left France in 1792, and we have a letter, actually the letter is in the Library of Congress in Washington, written by Barbier to George Washington himself asking for a job. And at that point, uh, Barbier was in Baltimore where he, where he had a brother, so he went straight to Baltimore where he knew someone, and then later moved on to Lexington. Um, there were some connections between the two cities, and he arrived with letters from people in Baltimore uh, to try and get established. He worked as a teacher, first a, a teacher of French, um, but his skills from the, his years in the military as an artillery officer, uh, he had learned the art of surveying. And there was a lot of land speculation and land buying and selling and surveyors were in high demand. And so he actually did very well as a surveyor to the point where he was able to invest in property himself. But we don't know when he came back. Uh, he, he came back, the last um, document we have, the last date dated document that we have from the United States is 1801. And beyond that, we don't know when he came back. He, we know he's in Paris by 1808. Um, so at some point in that period of seven years, he came back. Um, Napoleon granted amnesty for the, the, uh, the people who had left France during the revolution, um, that they would not be prosecuted in any way. So in 1802, 
So chances are he came back after that, but we don't know exactly when. However, living in the States would have exposed him to a very different form of society and uh, approaches to education and a number of things. So those years were probably quite formative. He was in his 20s and 30s, which are an important time in, in sort of thinking about what you want to do with the rest of your life. Um, so he would have come in contact with people who are not hidebound by tradition um, and who perhaps were more open to new ways of doing things while living in the States. Sounds like he was alive during a time when everything was being questioned with the French Revolution. You know, maybe we'll exactly. change the way we keep track of time or the calendar and just everything. And then mm -hmm. all for grabs, yeah. Yeah, it's a brand new country, figuring things out too. Yeah. Just perfect for an inventor. Uh, and so briefly, what Charles invented was a bunch of different uh, reading and writing systems that were felt by touch. We went over in depth in our last interview uh, which I will link below. Uh, but basically, Charles's system of writing raised lines and dots inspired Louis Braille to create Braille. And that's why we're talking about on this channel. So, so Charles's invention inspired Braille. So moving on to our third point is that Charles created alternate methods of writing for lots of different users, blind people, deaf people, the poor, travelers, diplomats, and the list goes on. His first publication or major publication in 1809 is a little green book, which is available to read on Google Books. Um, and in it, he proposes, that he says there, there are a dozen methods in it, but there are so many alternatives to that method. It, there might be as many as two dozen different ways of writing in there. And they range from extremely simple ways of writing just using simple little little sort of dashes um, to more complicated methods. And each one is intended for a different kind of audience. He even included a method of finger spelling, which could be used by deaf people or to communicate uh, in, with, with that way. He, some of the more complicated ways, he suggested that diplomats who needed to uh, communicate in code and not be understood by other people. Uh, he had methods for them. And, and some of those methods, um, the, the letters are made to look like musical notes on a stave. Um, so a whole spectrum of different forms of writing. In the introduction to the book though, he very much stresses that, uh, that this, is, this is to open up writing, particularly for people who who did not have access to writing or for whom writing was difficult. Um, so writing was extremely difficult for people who are blind, um, but also uh, people, the, people with, with low levels of education or people who are uh, you know, travelers, for example, who don't have access to writing materials and need to make notes while on the road. This is in the days before even such a thing as a fountain pen. If you wanted to write in those days, you had to have a bottle of ink and a pen and a piece of paper. So a whole way, whole spectrum of different ways of capturing either letters or sounds um, that could be used by a whole range of different people for different purposes. So I call it um, solutions in search of problems. Um, he, he offers all these different solutions to people who have different problems that would pre other, prevent them from writing normal messages using the normal alphabet. So it's very broad thinking, really. It's, it's quite, quite an extraordinary leap of imagination um, that we can get away from the alphabet, but we can still communicate in writing in all sorts of different ways. I feel like he has a really big heart for helping people having universal education for everyone across all classes. Yes, that was that was very important to him. And that brings us to number four, that he believed that writing and spelling need to be radically simplified to put literacy within reach for all. Indeed, um, he felt that, among other things, it took too long for people to learn how to write um, and that writing itself was very difficult. He, he himself, 
judging by the look of his own handwriting, he struggled with it. He certainly struggled with spelling. He had dreadful spelling. Um, but uh, he found he found that writing was very difficult. And indeed, in those days, um, when literacy levels were much, much lower than they are now, it was quite possible for people to learn how to read without ever learning how to write as well. We tend to think of the two as going hand in hand, but in fact, they're quite separate skills. Um, and it's not easy to learn the skills of writing. And, and these days, um, you know, they, they, they don't teach writing in schools the way they used to. And I think a lot of children struggle because it, it does take a lot of time and fine motor skills in order to create letters on a page, conventional letters on a page. So Barbier's idea was that if you created something very simple where if you could just sort of sim simply make a little stroke, either with a pen or with say a knife um, or anything else, if you could make these little little scratches on a page that are just little straight lines or little curved lines, that would be easier. Um, you you would not have 25 or 26 completely different shapes to learn. You just learned a few simple shapes and then you combine them to create writing. So this was his idea for universal education. And he's particularly insistent that people people who are very poor or people who have to work for a living starting at a very young age, they don't have the time to do this. They never learn these skills. So he wanted to put them within reach of as many people as possible. So, and he, he was quite um, idealistic in his thinking. He believed that universal literacy would lead to you know, universal goodwill and harmony. Um, now we now we know he was wrong, um, but he did honestly believe that extending the reach of education and literacy was going to help people understand each other and get along better and participate more in the you know political life and all kinds of different things. He was he had a sort of utopian vision of how things could be when everybody could write. Uh, so Charles he met Louis Braille in 1833. Uh, that was four years after Louis had already published his very first book. And then mm -hmm. they became friends. They weren't rivals. So Braille, of course, knew who, who Barbier was. Um, and the, he, he was at the school. And along with everybody else, he used the tools that Barbier gave to the school and the various materials that Barbier gave to the school. Um, Barbier donated a whole lot of stuff to the school to help people use his method of writing with raised points. But Barbier had no idea who Braille was. Um, and in 1833, as you mentioned, uh, there is a letter he writes to the head of the school, a man named Guignet, and says, I have been told that somebody else has done, made a modification of my system and I would very much like to see it. So presumably, uh, Guignet sends over a copy of Braille's First, procédé. Um, Barbier reads it overnight because the, the letters come very close together and immediately writes to Braille and says, well done, well done. This is great. Um, you know, being Barbier, he says, I would have done a few things differently, but never mind. You've done it. You've done a great job. Um, and this is the first procédé, which is, is different from the Braille we have now. It included um, dots and dashes and was a little bit more complicated. And it took Braille another eight years to refine it and simplify it to the, the version we have now. Um, but uh, anyway, after receiving this letter, Braille writes a very kind letter back to Barbier and the two of them meet. Um, there are mentions in the letters um, after 1833 of several visits that Braille and a friend make to Barbier's uh, house. Um, Barbier's getting on now. Uh, it, it, 1833 is only eight years before his death in his in his 70s. So he's in his 60s and uh, not terribly uh, mobile, I think. Um, but uh, so it's usually Braille going to see Barbier. But the letters that we that come down to us are friendly, cordial, supportive, encouraging, um, and and clearly the, the, the two admired each other. Braille 
in his books, acknowledged his debt to Barbier. And a lot of people think, oh, well, he's just being kind and generous. No, no, he was being accurate. Could not have done what he did without those tools and without the germ of the idea of communicating with raised dots in a form of code. Without that crucial breakthrough, Barbie, uh, Braille simply could not have done what he did. Um, Barbie had the, the, the breakthrough thinking, the sort of completely, we'd call it out of the box thinking of trying to get away from raised letters, trying to get away from the alphabet altogether. Nobody else thought of getting away from the alphabet. Everybody else was trying to create a way that blind people could read a version of the alphabet. Barbier was a, a, an odd man. There's no, no, there's no question. His, his uh, correspondence shows that he's uh, quite obsessive about his ideas um, and not very good with criticism. Uh, fortunately, Braille never did criticize him, though um, Pinier wrote a document that suggested he did criticize Barbier. And you can imagine that Barbier would not like that. But he never, but Braille never did criticize Barbier. He was always very kind and very respectful. But uh, Barbier, yes, he was. He was a funny guy, and it takes somebody as weird as Barbier to do what he did. An ordinary, conventional person would not have come up with an alternative to the alphabet. Barbier made that leap because he was very different and very outside the mainstream. Um, so. Yes, he was he was an odd person, but uh, but he the Braille was was kind and respectful, and Barbier was encouraging in return. Was there anything else you'd like to share about Barbier before we wrap it up? Those are the main points I wanted to make uh, because and the the just you mentioned uh, the idea of universal education that Barbier's main motivating force was the idea of education for everybody literacy for everybody, the ability to write for everybody. And they were a long way away from that in the early 19th century in France. They had a long way to go for universal literacy. So that was his, his main motive. Plus, I think the, the fact that he himself found it difficult and he used that insight. Um, somebody who sort of took to reading and writing like a duck to water would not necessarily have realized how people struggle um, it's often people um, who struggle with something who make the real breakthrough, breakthroughs in improving that for other people. Well, thank you for helping us celebrate uh, his birthday. Absolutely. Thank you very much.